Hi everyone and welcome to this question and answer session for studying law at the University of Cambridge. I'm Catherine and I'm the school's liaison officer at St Catherine's or CATS as most of us call it, so that's probably what we're going to call it in this session. Um, we've got a fab panel here today to answer all your questions about um, things related to studying the actual course of law at Cambridge or being a student at CATS, the social side of life at Cambridge, absolutely anything we're happy to answer questions on. Um, we're going to be using the Q&A feature which you'll find at the bottom of your screen and that's going to let you type in any of your questions, big or small, you can ask questions anonymously as well. But while those questions start coming in, I'll ask all our panellists to introduce themselves. So if we could start with our um, staff and fellows, let's go um, alphabetically by first name and then if our students want to introduce themselves. So I'm Ivan Scales and I'm the admissions tutor in the Arts and Humanities. I'm Liron Schmilowitz and I'm Director of Studies in Law. I'm Megan and I'm the Admissions Administrator for CATS. And our students? Yeah, uh, I'm Emily and I've just finished my second year in Law at CATS. And I'm Irona and I've also just finished my second year um, for Law and CATS. Thank you. And um, we had a few questions emailed in advance as well. And um, one of the questions we've been asked a lot is how to go about picking a college, especially now that students can't come and visit the colleges in person. So Emily Marina, do you have any tips on picking a college or are there any particular reasons why you pick St. Catharines or you think people should pick St. Catharines? Um, I never actually went to any of the open days. I live in Romania, so it isn't that far away, but it's just, it wasn't something I thought was necessarily useful. So you don't need to stress about that. I think, um, all the colleges are pretty much the same and in terms of academics they're really all the same because most of the work you do is directed by your faculty so you really don't need to worry about that. Some things you might want to consider are location. Um, Cambridge again is very small but if you're particularly interested in being close to the faculty or close to some sports facilities or something then that's something you might want to consider just look at the map and then also I would say going for a small or medium-sized college in terms of number of students is a good thing if you're really interested in being feeling like you're part of the community and you know everyone in your subject but also pretty much everyone in your year. I think Emily can agree that's something that we're both enjoying and yeah CATS is, is really friendly and um, it just struck me as a very nice place. I also enjoyed the um, the fact that for, for law, for admissions, there are slight differences between the colleges. So that's again, something you need to consider. Some of them ask you for an essay. Some of them have two interviews, others have one. There are slight differences in there. And again, for CATS, that's something that the fellows can tell you more about, but the, the way we should have conducted, at least in my year, was something that I really enjoyed. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, I was lucky enough to go to a CATS Open Day and I loved the people, like honestly, it was just because the all of the CATS ambassadors seemed to be friends and I saw that and I was like, I want that. <laughs> so unfortunately, this isn't the same thing, but also a big reason I chose CATS was because, I mean, this is really strange, but in second year, we all get to live in these um, apartment blocks called St. Chad's um, with four to five of, no, three to four of our friends. And I just thought, oh, well, that would be quite nice because in Cambridge, usually you just get your one room and you live in a hall. Um, and I thought I wanted that like typical, like student apartment experience. So I also thought cats would be good for that. So that's also something to consider. It's like um, housing options. Thank you. Um, you mentioned interviews and that's one of the things that we've been asked about as well. Um, Liron, perhaps you could say how interviews for law at CATS work and whether you know if there's different formats of interviews for, for law across the colleges. Yes, um, well, first of all, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. Um, when you apply to law at CATS, uh, we will in, uh, uh, you submit an application like for all other colleges um, and uh, uh, if you are invited to interview, then uh, you will be uh, interviewed interviewed twice. Um, 
on the same day. And in addition to the two interviews, you will sit uh, a written test um, on the same day. Now, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, um, I, I think that's the answer to the question. Uh, what do I know about other colleges? As far as I know, all other colleges have the same procedure. It's possible that um, a minority of colleges don't have a written test, but um, most colleges have have two tests um, and a so have, have two in interviews and and the written test. Thank you, Lauren. Um, perhaps the students could say kind of how you found your law interviews. Were you scared beforehand? Um, what did you think they went like? Would you have any tips for someone um, kind of at the end of year 12 or equivalent now thinking of applying soon? So I was really surprised by how little prior knowledge is required. And like, it's true what they say. Um, they really are interested in the way you think and not in like, statistics or information you can just bring to the table during the interview um, and it's really nice because you have one interview where you get to kind of talk more about like the philosophy of law and it'll be a lot like about um, why is it this way and then the other one where it's more of an application and I really enjoyed both aspects and I think like um, they both allow you to just kind of show what you're good at um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's honestly, I had a really good experience in my law interviews and I, yeah, don't know if Miruna has more to add. No, I also really enjoyed my interviews and yeah, I think I did a lot of reading before my interviews, as in a lot of reading, because just because it was something really new to me, the fact that you could find so many introductory books about the law, which is really good. And I think it's good that, um, that the university and the faculty encourage you to do some reading beforehand so you have some idea of what law in implies. Um, but yeah, no, in the actual interview, as opposed to, I believe, other subjects where you, you study some of it in high school and you need to have some ground knowledge in law, you don't need that. But what I found was it was much more comforting for me, at least, to know that I've, I've read some stuff and I know some basics at least about the general way in which the legal system works in the UK or some very general things so that I could work on that and develop some arguments and this, the, the whole discussion in the interview. And yeah, it's not necessary, but I would recommend it because first of all, I, I thought it was yeah a bit comforting for me. And second of all, you need to be used to a lot of reading for law. So um, that's good practice. Advice for writing a personal statement. So how would you go about writing a personal statement? I know Ivan always has a good answer to this. And also, um, should you write about A-levels and why you chose them in a personal statement? Okay, uh, so the way to think about this is that um, you have to think, what is the personal statement for? And one of the things to point out is that uh, I would worry about them less for Cambridge than I would for other universities. And the reason is that we have the admissions interview and it means that we can um, test things and assess things in slightly different ways to other universities. So the, the personal statement matters less for us. Uh, it doesn't get scored as part of your admission. It's a chance for you, mainly from our perspective, to, to give us an indication of your motivation. So why is it that you wanna commit three years of your life to studying this subject, in, in this case, law? And there are various ways of doing that. Um, as a rule of thumb, we recommend a split of about 80 to 20 percent, um, 80 percent on curricular and supercurricular activities. So you describe what it is that you're doing at school, especially if they're skills that are, de you, that are developing through particular A-levels. Not everyone applies to us with law A-level. I think, I don't know, Liron, actually most people don't apply to us with law A-level. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. So most people actually won't have done any law at school. Um, so you need to think about how, how is it that you've come to a decision to study law? Um, what is it that you've done at school or outside school in particular as well that is pushing you in that direction? Is it a book that you've read? Is it something that you've watched? Is it a career that you have in mind? All those are, are useful things to signal in the personal statement. 
Um, so we're looking for motivation. We're also looking for evidence that you have the right skill set to do well and to cope with the system at Cambridge. Um, the way we teach here is quite intense. There's a lot, especially in the arts and humanities, a lot of reading involved, a lot of self-study. And so as an admissions tutor, I would like to see evidence that you're already developing those reading and analytical skills outside the classroom. So this is where listing books comes in and, and your supercurricular activities come in in particular. Um, I have th usually I say three things you need to think about, three recommendations, top tips from me about personal statements. Uh, the first one is to be honest. And this is particularly important at Cambridge because your interviewers may well ask you something from your personal statement. So if you've written a whole list of books that sound clever, but haven't really read them at all or in any great depth, you're possibly inviting difficult questions that you won't be able to answer. So be truthful about why it is that you want to study this subject and how you develop your interest outside the classroom. Um, be specific. Uh, it's very tempting to think that you can game the system and it's just an exercise in tick boxing and listing lots of things, lots of books, lots of activities, lots of extracurriculars. That doesn't really help us. It's much better to be specific about the ways you are exploring your subject outside the classroom, the sorts of books that you genuinely have read and engaged with. And that is more useful for us to get a sense of your abilities. Um, and then finally, be critical. Uh, one of the big steps up from A-level and, and IB and other educational systems at, uh, at uh, high school, secondary school, to going up to university is that a lot of A-level learning is, is quite rote learning. You memorize things and then you repeat them. Whereas uh, stepping up to university requires you to be much more critical. And what I mean by that is that you're being tasked with assessing the strengths and weaknesses of different arguments, different theories. And so it's good in your personal statement to try and do a little bit of that. So better, rather than listing 10 books that you might or might not have read, listing two or three and then comparing them to each other or, or telling us a little bit more, more about them. What did you think of them? Did you find the arguments convincing? If so, why? If not, why not? That is starting to show critical faculties, which you're going to be um, needing if you come to Cambridge, if you go to university in general anyway. So to summarize, be honest, be specific and be critical. And I think if you do that in your personal statement, you won't be able to go too far wrong. Uh, thank you, Ivan. That was indeed a, a very good answer. And I don't think I have anything to add. A question for the students. What other colleges do you think of applying to? Um, I was also, so I knew I wanted to go to a kind of a small to medium sized college to be able to know everyone in my year and I also wanted it to be central and I really like the look of older colleges and they also happen to be more central so I was looking at Trinity Hall um, and yeah I don't really remember but I think it was between Cats and Trinity Hall but now with retrospect um, I think I also really like Pembroke and Queens and I would say that all of these colleges I've just listed are colleges that kind of fit my criteria, kind of small, central, pretty um, and yeah I think I ultimately chose CATS because I liked the people there and uh, I really wouldn't say that a college choice is that important, um, there's no need to agonize over it for years, um, it's better to just kind of focus on why you want to study the subject you want to study and yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much the same for me. I, I wanted a smaller medium college. I wanted it to be old, but not that old. And from that point of view, I at least am quite happy with the, the rooms, for example, that you get in CADS, especially in CADS in the second year, as Emily said. So you might want to be careful when choosing an old college that some of them might be too old. So, but that's just something you can see from pictures online. And yeah, I also I was also looking at Corpus Christi, which is right across the road from CATS. I'm not entirely sure. I, I knew someone who had applied to Corpus Christi, and I think that back then they had to do, they received some material prior to the interview as in a few weeks before the interview and I thought what I want to do is since it's an interview I just want to do everything on the spot so I'm not sure that's still the case but that is that was the case for for cats and that was the difference between cats and corpus back then so I think that's what made me choose cats in the end but yeah again really good choice 
Thanks, guys. Um, I've also put a link in the chat for, for all the attendees as well. If you want to check out Cambridge's just really recently put together a virtual tour. So it went live just earlier this month. Um, and you basically get to see loads of info about all the colleges and departments and see them on the map so you can figure out what's close to your department if that's what you're worried about. Um, and you can see kind of info about the colleges written by both students and staff um, all in one place. Okay, some more questions. I think Ivan wants to answer a couple of these. Oh no, he's already answered these ones. Um, yeah, there's a few more I'd like to answer. Okay, Fab, do you want to pick out the ones that you'd like to, to answer? <laughs> yeah, I'll dive in. in the stream. Uh, we're gonna get, we have got a few and we're going to get more questions about how many applicants do we get, how many do we take, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, we get somewhere usually between about 40 and 50 applicants for law. Kind of 50 is a, is a good number to, to think about. In general, across the university we will invite about 75 percent to interview um, it's probably maybe a little bit higher in law but about 20 or 25 percent of applicants are what we call deselected which means they're not invited to interview and that's really based on an assessment of their paperwork so GCSEs uh, and A-level prediction grades. It, it, mainly the A-level predictions, if they really, if an applicant really doesn't look like they have a realistic chance of meeting our typical offer, which for law is A star AA, then there's a good chance they won't be invited to interview. So we invite probably 75, 80% in law to interview. Uh, we make from the 50 people who apply, usually somewhere between eight and 10 offers. Um, there's a little bit of fluctuation, but that's a, a, a good usual number that we take. And then we all, also put into the pool usually a good number of applicants and so the winter pool is what happens is if we having gone through the application process we think someone's application is strong but we don't have place for them at St Catherine we will make a recommendation to our colleagues at other colleges in the winter pool which happens in January and colleges have a chance then to take those people and we usually get about three or four people taken from the pool so you can work it out 50 people apply and out of that usually somewhere around 12 will get a place either at St Catharines or at another college in Cambridge so it's somewhere between four or five to one is the applicant to place ratio which is pretty standard across most colleges and most subjects thank you and um, we've also had quite a few questions about for A levels. Um, so if you apply with four A levels to Cambridge, are you required to carry on taking all four um, right up until the end? And will an offer be made on three or four? Um, and will we differ an offer if someone's got four as opposed to three? Will that change our offer? No. Um, that's a very short answer. I'll give a slightly longer one. Our typical offer is A star AA. In the vast majority of cases, I can't remember, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got lawyers involved, so I'm being very careful about how I phrase things. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, uh, an offer would be made on three A-levels. I can't remember the last time I saw in the Arts and Humanities an offer made on four A-levels. So three A-levels, A star AA, therefore the fourth one doesn't matter as far as we're concerned. And what, if you get an offer and we specify three in certain subjects, it won't matter or not whether you drop the fourth. That's entirely your choice. And there's a perfectly good reasons for doing four. Yeah, if you want to explore another subject that you're really passionate about, but in terms of our offers, it won't make a difference. Um, some questions now for Luron and the students. Um, what would you recommend for preparing for the Cambridge Law Test? So perhaps if you could chat a bit about what you look for from a Directors and Studies point of view. And then the students, if you've got any tips for preparing. Of course. So first of all, I would like to emphasize that um, no, no knowledge of, of the law is um, assumed or expected. So we won't be asking you about English law, about acts of parliament or about cases. Uh, uh, what we are looking for is academic potential and in the context of, of law this means that we want to see um, whether you have the ability to analyze situations uh, as a lawyer would we want to see if you can apply rules to facts we want to see if you can construct um, pers persuasive arguments if you can defend propositions um, and also, importantly, if you can reflect uh, uh, on the law. So, for example, 
for questions like uh, should we have uh, uh, euthanasia or, or, or capital punishment. So reflect, you know, intelligently uh, uh, on legal options. Now, um, so, so that's what we are looking for, not um, you know, hard knowledge of, of, of the law. You know, act so and so says this, this will not be required. What we're looking for is legal ability. We want to see if you can think like, like a lawyer. Um, uh, uh, what else can I say? So uh, uh, in the interviews, there are generally two, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I suppose, two kinds of questions. Um, we might ask you to uh, um, read a legal text shortly before the interview and then ask you questions about this, this text or, or we might give you sh shortly or, or we might give you um, a, fic a fictitious act and ask you uh, um, to, to apply this uh, um, regulation or provision to, to, to different factual scenarios. Uh, so this is what you might expect to be asked in the interview itself. Now, in, in terms of how you might prepare for uh, the interview, um, I suppose there is no text that, that will give you the knowledge that you need as such, simply because legal knowledge is not required, knowledge of the law itself, but you may, as I believe Miruna has said, uh, you may want to read um, uh, uh, some books um, uh, that are uh, written for um, people who are c considering studying law in university. Uh, and just to give you one example, there is a book called Letters to a Law Student uh, by uh, Nick, Nick McBride. Uh, there's also a, a book called What About Law by a number of authors, including Graham Virgo and, and Catherine Barnard. And uh, uh, these books help you think about the law like, like a lawyer, which is what we look for. So, yes. Um. Uh, what I would have to add to that is um, the way you can practice writing uh, like a, co a coherent argument and kind of just, yeah, an argumentative essay is that um, you can, well, I don't know, you can, pra I mean, you get better with writing the more you write, but also what I find incredibly helpful is just reading a lot of different essays and you can do that if you're just reading the news. So. I really, really recommend keeping up with the news, not because they'll ask you anything um, in the interview about it, but because the pra just reading opinion pieces um, and just practicing reading about what people think and reflecting on social issues and reflecting on, especially like nowadays with all of like the coronavirus issues, you reflecting on why why did the government issue this act? Like, why is it this way? And also another thing that I've, been finding quite useful is just on Twitter, which is free. You can follow law commentators and then they always have like a new issue every day to tweet about and then they'll link like maybe a link to one of their articles and what they think. And then the more you read about this, the more you can like construct your own arguments and like reflect more about these issues. And I think it's this type of critical thinking that you develop through reading and thinking that you can then apply at the interview. So it's none of this is like real material that you should remember, but it's the type of way of thinking and expressing yourself that you can really practice through these really accessible sources like Twitter is free, The Guardian is free and um, the BBC as well. So that's what I really recommend. Yeah, I totally agree with what Emily said. And then in addition to that, again, um, I think it's really good to read the news and to read news articles and opinion articles, um, not just because they're, not just to learn how to write a very structured and coherent essay, which is really important, but also I think it's good not just reading essays that are very obviously related to law, but articles and things that deal with things completely different. Because what I found in my Cambridge Law Test and in the interview as well is that just because 
law covers literally everything and it's so incredibly wide that every single thing that you read about is going to help you in some way not just because it helps you f learn how to have an argument that is logical and, and the way in which you can apply it but also just in knowing things about life and having a broad general knowledge and then building on from that and thinking about the ways in which the law might apply to all these various situations so again yeah i i, I think that just having an interest for for many as many topics as possible in general is can be very useful um, someone's asked with regards to the Cambridge Law Test, when you are constructing your argument, is it a good idea to present your view, so like the student's view, or should we mention both sides to the argument? Do you have any advice on that, Lulon? So if I may begin, uh, I think you should definitely present your, your own view. In fact, uh, it, it's your view that we want to hear. So in the essay, uh, uh, you will be in, invited to uh, um, uh, to tell us what you think about this legal issue. Now, uh, in in uh, defending your view, you will inevitably have to deal with the counter arguments. Okay, so uh, when you construct a case for you know your view, you can't just ignore. Uh, uh, um, the potential flaws or weaknesses in your view. So I suppose the answer is yes and yes. Yes, you have to uh, build a consistent, coherent case for what you believe. And to do so, to do so effectively, you need to, to, to acknowledge and refute opposing views. Perfect answer, thank you. A question for the students, what do you wish you'd known before applying to Cambridge or CATS? And um, so if you were to give yourself advice a few years ago when you're at these students' age, what would it be? I think I would really just tell myself that, you know, I can do it. <laughs> I think there's this idea of Cambridge. Um, so uh, Miruna lives in Romania and I live in Switzerland and I don't think either of us come from communities where um, many people go to Oxbridge or even like study abroad. So I think I definitely applied not really knowing much about the application process, not really knowing much about like what life Cambridge would be like and not knowing if I'd fit in. And like thankfully I got to go to the open dates and realize that everyone was perfectly normal. And I think that's really what I really want to convince everyone of is that um, Cambridge is full of just people who are good at school. Like essentially it's not people who like perhaps in the sciences and there are a few exceptional cases of people who are really outstanding. But at the end, I really believe that we're just people who really want to be studying our particular subject, who are really like enthusiastic about reading and ideas, but we're not, you know, so incredible um, <laughs> and definitely everyone can make it if they really want to be studying here and um, yeah I would just honestly I would just want to give myself a confidence boost because I think that's the most important thing um, all of the information is out there on the internet uh, all of the help um, there are so many like mentorship schemes now and that type of thing that can help you um, so all you need to do is truly believe that you can make it there and go into your interview knowing that like you're there to just show what you're capable of and that like that's the best you can do so yeah yeah definitely I think just because there's so much that you can learn about Cambridge and the colleges and the Cambridge life in general um, especially online these days I think you can now get a pretty good idea of what it is like and yes it's easy to be worried because it is Cambridge and it is competitive and everyone is really good at what they're doing but I think what I would say I would have found even more comforting was the fact that everything that I imagine everything really really is the way I imagined it to be so people take their work seriously but also, I have been told that you can have a perfectly good life in Cambridge as a student in Cambridge as well. You can do lots of things and have passions. And even in law, where again, there's 
a lot of reading and a lot of work I think you can definitely do everything that you're doing now in high school outside of school and even more because there's so many opportunities and the people are so diverse you're just absolutely gonna love the Cambridge community so just yeah going to your interview and applying to Cambridge believing that you will enjoy it and you are going to fit in is really important because it's also really true. Thank you. Um, Ivan, I think you want to answer a few questions that we've had about GCSEs. Yes, lots of questions about high school qualifications and academic standard. Uh, lots of people do apply with straight A stars, that's true, um, but there are no GCSE requirements um, for the University of Cambridge. So I think, I think the vast majority of people will apply to us with five A stars or more. It doesn't mean that if you don't have that, if you don't have 10 A stars, you shouldn't bother applying. Um, as to other international systems, you might not have done GCSEs, but we, we are perfectly versed in people applying to us from all over the world. So I'm used to dealing with academic uh, qualification systems from all over the world, so don't worry about that. Uh, in terms of the general academic standard, I'd say that GCSEs are really not that important. We'll look at them as one of the bits of evidence of your academic strengths to date, but more important is your A-level predicted grades or equivalent or IB, um, because they will be, if you get an offer, that will, that's what your offer will be based on. So for law, A star, AA. So that's much more important than um, 10 A stars at GCSE. So if someone has asked, uh, my own school did nine GCSEs, so would that put me at a disadvantage because a lot of people apply with 10? No, not at all. Thanks, Simon. Um, a couple of questions about the environment at Cambridge. So do you find it very competitive? Um, and do you feel like the pressure because you're studying at um, a world-renowned university? Um, I feel that the environment in Cambridge is competitive, but I feel it in a productive, not in a toxic way. So I feel like sometimes just seeing that the people around you are so passionate about so many different things in law reminds you of the reasons why you applied to Cambridge in the first place. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's, it's just a good thing that everyone takes their work seriously. And I've personally never felt like this is really too much, like this is a burden, like this is forcing me to do better. And of course, there will always be people around you doing less work than you do and more work than you do. And I think that that is important and that applies everywhere that you should not compare yourself to the people around you because that's when you're gonna start worrying about not doing enough. So just moving at your own pace is perfectly acceptable, yeah. Um, yeah, to add on to that, I think law as a subject is naturally quite competitive. It's just the type of person who goes into it. Um, you can't avoid that. But law at CATS, um, and I thought it was like this in all colleges, but like having, sp having spoken to people at several other colleges, not to name, I won't name them, but um, what I want to say is law at CATS is like a very supportive and nurturing environment. Um, like the third years, for example, the people in the year above um, helped us so much throughout this past year um, with all of our subject choices, for example, um, for papers we're gonna take next year. And throughout the entire year, like we always had people checking in on us in the library being like, are you okay? How's this paper going for you? Do you need any help? Um, and I think this might not be the case in all colleges, but what I can definitely say is that law at CATS, you know, from the director of studies to your supervisors to the, your fellow students, no one wants to bring you down. Everyone wants to help you and for you to be, do your best. So when, you know, whereas Cambridge as a whole and law might be, a bit competitive there's like when you're in the small cats community you really don't feel that and um another thing i'd want to mention is there's so there's a lot of welfare support cats um to help you if you have problems with stress or anything else so i really do think that like it is competitive like you can't refute that but there is so much support um within like like structurally and also within the community that like it's fine so I would say not to worry about that 
Yeah, I would definitely echo what, what Emily said. Um, we've put a lot of work and it came to make sure students are supported in terms of welfare. I mean, at CAPS, we have like a paid welfare officer. We have welfare representatives on the student committees who organise lovely events for the students. Um, and we do our best so that if people are feeling the pressure or they're worried about work or whatever, there's different people that you can reach out and talk to both inside and outside of um, college, both staff and students. Um, let's have a look at some of the questions coming in. How good is Cambridge and or St Catharines in terms of career opportunities? So um, from like an individual perspective, so perhaps you as students, you find there are like opportunities for you to, to meet people from law firms or any like help with getting work over the vacations, things like that? Um, I think Cambridge for a lot is like we're so lucky and I think I don't even realize how lucky we are but uh, in terms of opportunities to meet firms so I Maruna is different so Maruna wants to go down the barrister track so she'll be able to talk about that more but for me for example I'm more interested in the solicitor track and there are so many firms that actually make, make the commute from London to come to Cambridge to like pay for you to have dinner um, just to come and meet you and talk about you about to you about their firm and about like what life is like um, working as a solicitor in the city. Um, and there are so many career firms, uh, career fairs um, and that type of thing. And I think like the opportunity is there, you just have to go and take it. Um, and yeah, I've, I can't really talk about whether or not it's helped me with applications. Like I, I don't really know, but in terms of information, I think it's honestly just there on a buffet and you just have to go and um, like, make the most of it. Yeah, I totally agree with Emily. And again, because you have so many opportunities, you do not need to know what you're going to do um, from your first or even your second or sometimes even your third year. So you get to, by being in Cambridge, you do get to experience a bit of everything because you have all those career fairs and all those people coming in and talking about what they're doing. So you just need to be proactive and go to the meetings and talk to people and do networking and you're going to find what you want. So you have that opportunity. And yeah, in terms of becoming a barrister, of course, that the chambers don't usually have the same tradition in coming into universities and, and doing a lot of networking and talking to people. That sometimes does happen. And, and I think in Cambridge, you have quite a few opportunities to go to mooting competitions or essay competitions and things that are um, uh, supported by and, and financed by chambers in London. And I, But I think in general, unless you actually study in London, you're not going to meet lots of people from, from London chambers coming in and talking about them. So you need to be, again, be proactive, go to London and, and go to do your mini pupillage over the holidays and everything. So look out for those opportunities. But there is a, a fair for barrister um, chambers in Cambridge in the law faculty. So just go there and again, talk to people and find out about your opportunities. And strictly speaking about the, the world of a barrister, I think, because this is a presentation about Cambridge and law cats in particular, I can definitely say that whilst people generally I guess they generally complain about it. I found it really comforting that in the barrister world, there are still a lot of Cambridge and Oxford people, which I think that's, that's good because it really, the work that you do here and the fact that in Cambridge in particular, you focus so much on the academic side of things and on critical thinking, not just learning the black letter law, but learning how to think and how to develop the law. Those are skills that I found particularly useful in the work of a barrister. I'm sure that's equally useful in the work of a solicitor as well, but at least from the research that I've done, trying to decide what I want to be when I graduate, I think that it can be even more useful for a barrister in, in the work that I do. And it, from that perspective, it really is a plus if you study law um, as an undergraduate, and especially if you study law at Cambridge. We've got a few questions about the exams that you take. So what do you feel is the benefit of taking yearly exams as opposed to exams just at the end of the three years? And also someone's asked, 
in preparation for the end of year's exams at Cambridge are there past paper question banks? So about the yearly exams, I would say that's a really good thing because you have everything fresh in your mind and I think it really depends on what you compare it with. I know in Oxford they have some exams in the first year and then again in the third year, but then in other systems and perhaps in the UK as well, in other unis, you have exams every couple of months or throughout the year or just different assessments. So I think this is a really good balance and a really good mix. Um, you, the workload, of course, is a lot because you don't have any assessments throughout the year. You only have your exams at the end of each academic year. But again, I think that is a good balance that helps you. It also helps you have a very round understanding of the um, syllabus in each particular paper. So you don't just get tested in each chapter, but you just understand it as a whole and apply it as a whole. Totally doable. Yes, uh, law is challenging and there is a lot, but that applies for law everywhere, all around the world, I think. Um, and yeah, I, I think that was that was really useful. I'm not exactly sure what the second question was about. The um, whether the basically if there are past paper um, examples for you to look at when you're like preparing for your exams at the end of the year, so to help you practice. Um, oh yeah, you, you definitely have past papers, you have loads of materials you need, you can look at, you have um, comments from um, people that I think came up with the, the past exam questions and that also marked them so they can really explain what went wrong and what was good and what was expected of students. So that I found that really helpful. Um, yes, past papers as well and even sometimes some examples of past answers from students. So yeah, all the material is there. There's a lot of support for you during the exams. You can always do some extra work and have it graded. You can always just ask for help, as Emily said, from not just from fellows and, and um, supervisors, but also from older students, especially in CAT. So yeah, it's I think overall, even though it is Cambridge, the exam experience you'll find is quite enjoyable. Yeah, I think the structure in law is so um, like well thought out and structured that you can't arrive, like when you get to the exam season, you're fully prepared, you know what to expect because we're assessed throughout the year um, through essays and um, problem questions that we give to our supervisors and then they correct and usually they give us uh, an actual grade and all of this doesn't count for our final grade because it's not part of the exam but it does give us a fair idea of um, where we stand and like of like potential progress we can make throughout the year so that when you get to exam term and you have to revise you've got all of the all of the assessments and all of the grades you got throughout the year that you can look back on and think oh what can I improve on what can I do better and as Marina said there's so many past exam papers and the examiner's reports where the examiners say specifically what they were looking for in that particular question and all of this really helps you to just do the best you can in exams like I would say it's extremely transparent um, and yeah I wouldn't be afraid of of having exams at the end of the year like you really do arrive prepared. Thank you. And um, someone's asked, I don't know if you know the answer, this, Lauren, do your exams in first year count towards your final grade of your degree? So I think I can take this. So um, the university is, it's actually a, a very topical question because the university is um, adopting a new uh, assessment scheme now. Uh, it's not final and it's not clear whether it will apply uh, next year in 2021. Um, but the model that we are moving towards is that um, the first year will not count towards uh, your overall grade for your degree. The weighting of the second year will be 50% and, and the weighting of the third year will be 50%. 50%, it will be 0, 50, 50. Um, at the moment, so before the change, you don't get an overall grade for your degree. So you get uh, uh, 
marks and a class for each of the three years of your degree. Okay, so at the moment, uh, all of the years count simply because there is no overall, overall grade. Um, but as I, I, I've said, uh, the university is moving towards a zero 50-50 model. Thanks, Liron. Um, a question for the students. Where are your favourite places to study? So this person's heard that the libraries are great. So perhaps you could chat about the Cats libraries and then any of the places that you like to study. So I can't study in my room. I don't really like it. I like to separate my work and life spaces. Um, so I love libraries. Uh, and at Cats we have two libraries, which is great. Um, one of them is more modern. Um, and it's got two floors, which is really fun. I think it's always, uh, and it's, I would say like cats libraries are also quite a social space. So it's really fun to just go to the library, run to a friend, have a quick chat, like not great for productivity, but really like nice to be in like a working environment and still get to like be social. And the other library is more of an older one. It's called the Sherlock library. Um, and it's just absolutely beautiful. Like your typical, like, Oxbridge type of aesthetic um, and otherwise what's great in Cambridge is that you can usually find your way into other li faculty libraries um, they don't really check so I really love going to the languages library I think it's got like a really nice vibe they give you cookies every Thursday which is so nice um, and if you've got friends at other colleges you'll need their card to access it but sometimes they're nice and you can go and sneak into another college um, which I've only done once, but I've heard like Keys has a great library, so I'd love to go check it out one day. So yeah, no, if you're a library enthusiast, you'll you'll really be happy with Cambridge. Like there, there's so much um, to kind of go and check out. Yeah, definitely. And I, I also do enjoy working in the library. I think that working in your room is sometimes nice when you really want to be alone, but it's usually distracting simply because you have your bed in there and that's just not the best place to study. But I also studied in the law faculty library quite a few times. I think that's good if you really need some time to separate yourself from people and distractions. And um, many students come to the law library from other faculties around the same site because it's really big. It's an impressive building. It's absolutely amazing. It also has a cafe downstairs. so all the comfort but some people also find it a bit intimidating just because everyone's really focused on their work and no one is chatting <laughs> so i think a good mix would be to do go there if you need some time to do some serious work away from distractions and i think you almost always find a place in there because there's just so many there's just such a big space for working and then also, yes, if you want something more relaxed or if it's late at night, then you can just go to the CAS library or to libraries from other colleges, as Emily said. That's a really nice place to learn. And I guess cafes around town, but I think you'd want to be close to your resources, at least for law. So the libraries are the best place to do your work in. Yeah, at CATS, both libraries are open 24-7, um, so if you're a night owl or you've left an essay to last minute, then you've got somewhere to, to go and work and let yourself in. Um, someone's asked, is it true that if there's a book that you want that isn't in the libraries, you can place an order and get it within 24 hours? The students are nodding. So um, I was so impressed by this. At the University Library, which we all have access to, you can place an order and within half an hour they'll find it for you um so that's so cool <laughs> then then they just put it on this little um like kind of desk and you can find it within usually within half an hour um i don't really know about cats but i think i've never had the problem where i couldn't find a book there's always somebody who has the book um or it's always somewhere that's accessible so yeah uh, if I may jump in, uh, just to add to what you were saying, Emily, uh, uh, at CATS, uh, if there is a book that you need and we don't have in our collection, we will order it for you. We have a budget for this. Uh, we can't guarantee, you know, delivery within 24 hours, but, but you will have it. If it's a book that you justifiably require. 
Thank you. Um, we've got a question that's what are the main differences between law at Oxford and law at Cambridge? So I don't know whether any of you actually know the answer to this, seeing as you're law at Cambridge. Um, I can try and answer this. Um, uh, I think that the similarities exceed the differences, but since we are asked about the differences, I think that the, that the main difference um, is that we have more of a faculty, both in terms of the physical facilities. I, I, I mean, I hope that I won't be accused of bias when I say that their law building is not as good as ours. And also, I think it's just an objective fact. I've been there. It's a small place and uh, um, the young who conducts a lot of um, you know, academic act act activities in it. So I think that in Oxford, um, the colleges uh, uh, um, assume more of the responsibility more of the teaching than, uh, uh, so here, the colleges do more of the teaching than in, in Oxford because they don't have much of a faculty. I'm, I'm not saying it, it's a bad thing, but it is a difference. Uh, and um, the other thing is that in Oxford, uh, um, they, they have tutorials as, as opposed to supervisions and the difference is not just in the name. Um, I think that the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the tutorials in Oxford are less st structured than uh, uh, in Cambridge um, and they are more driven by the student. So the student would be asked to talk about, to, to present their essays. We do this here too, but I think from what I know in Cambridge, uh, the supervisions tend to be more supervisor driven and less student driven. These are not big differences and it does vary from uh, subject to subject and indeed from supervisor to supervisor. But 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 if I can make a generalization, I think that in Cambridge the supervisions are more structured um, and more supervisor driven than in Oxford. This is what I would say. Thank you, Durham. Um, a question for the students. Can you go to other colleges to see friends or are all your friends based in Cat? Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, the thing is, this was before the virus, so I don't really know what kind of, um, like, what it'll be like in October. But yeah, normally I've, I've got friends at plenty of different colleges. It's really fun when they live kind of outside of the centre, so you really go, like, I would have no reason to leave the five minute walking radius of my <laughs> of cats um, if I didn't have friends at Murray Edwards, for example. And it's really nice to go and see what life is like at different colleges. And you realize, you usually just realize how great other colleges are. And, but no, so it's really nice. See, there are so many ways to meet people from other colleges. So I really wouldn't worry about um, being limited to cats. And yeah, so up until now, it's really fine to just go and visit people from other colleges. Um, but as I said, like it, it might change, but we'll see. Thanks. Sorry, we're coming to the end of the session, so I'll quickly go through some of these other questions. From what I've gathered, you can choose specific modules in your second year. Um, what did you two choose? So perhaps you could quickly say which modules you chose in second year. Um, so I chose international law because it's a really interesting, a really popular course in Cambridge. Um, and I think that's the, the international law course in Cambridge is renowned on a global scale, at least that's what they told us. But it was really, really good and everyone's really prepared and um, really amazing. Um, I also chose international, um, chose administrative law because I really enjoyed constitutional law in my first year and we're going to learn more about this as you go on. But yeah, again, really interesting. And also criminal procedure and evidence because that is a typical criminal law witness 
cross-examination thing that you see in TV shows. And it really is that, and it's really interesting. And I think if you want to be a barrister, not just in criminal law, but in any area of the law, that's the kind of skill and kind of knowledge that you will need and it will help you figure out whether or not you want to be a barrister. So totally recommend that, yeah. Um, yeah, last year I, basically we get to take papers in the Institute of Criminology. So I got to do that and that's really cool. It's in a different building and it's a really nice building. And that was a paper called, I think, The Criminal Sentence in the Penal System, where you learn a lot more about like kind of the sociological aspects of the application of law, which is really interesting and very topical. I would say there's always like, you know, you bring in new stories to your supervisions, which is really fun. Um, and next year I'm planning on taking international law and intellectual property. So yeah, there are so many options. I wish I could take more, to be honest. Thank you. Um, someone's asked if I'm interested in eventually doing humanitarian work, is a law degree a good idea? I would say absolutely. Um, and so perhaps you could answer what are some career paths that students take other than becoming lawyers? Liron, I don't know if you know of anyone who's graduated and done fun things. So actually a fairly large proportion of our graduates uh, don't go on to become lawyers. So this is absolutely uh, uh, an, an option, even a common one. Now, what are some of these options? Um, you can go and work for an NGO. So I, I think this uh, links back to the human rights question. You can go into consulting, you, you, you can go into um, government, the civil service. Uh, you can go um, and work for the law commission. Uh, which is not the same as being a lawyer. You uh, review the laws and uh, uh, advise on legal reform. Um, uh, you, you can go in, into journalism and indeed into politics. So I think there are so many options. It's one of the law is one of these um, subjects that is valued by by many employers and in many fields. Thank you. Um, and I would just add to that, like Emily and Marina said earlier, there's a fantastic career service um, at Cambridge and it's a lifelong career service. So if you decide to mix up career at age 40 or whatever, um, then you can go back to them um, and get support with, with CVs and interviews and applications and all of that kind of thing. That's brought us to the end of our questions. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. We really hope that you found this useful. Um, if there's anything else that you wish you'd asked us while we were on the call, then you can always email us at our undergraduate admissions email address at St. Catherine's. Um, and that will come to Megan, our admissions administrator. Um, and either she can answer or she can forward it on to one of our students or fellows or anyone who's best suited to, to answer your question. So feel free to get in touch if there's anything that you wish you had asked us. Um, thank you to all our panelists for joining today. That's been great. So best of luck, everyone, with your with your applications. Um, have a nice day. Thanks, panelists. Bye, everyone.